Hi, my name is Noam Stark. My pronouns are she, her. The figure eight is a panic motion of a bait fish when it's caught between the predator and the boat. You are a mid-flex rod person. Stick to your casting style. I am the owner and operator of Predators on the Fly. I've been fly fishing since 2000. Um, started with the troll trout thing and much like the other two presenters, uh, you quickly get into the multi-species game and warm water species is definitely on the list. <laughs> Musky fishing is uh, throughout the year, but uh, the prime time is fall, which we're quickly approaching. So much like the other two presenters, uh, you tend to really fall in love with these species. And that's really what drives you to really go in these directions. Uh, I was a trout guide in the East and moved to the Midwest uh, up at the, the Eastern UP and trout just weren't the thing that was readily available. Um, and the water became kind of difficult uh, with few, you know, lots of anglers, lots of competition. So I was looking for a, a ready resource that was self-sustaining uh, and where you didn't see anybody else all day because that's the kind of fishing I much prefer. Um, and muskie was it for in that area. So that's kind of how I ended up diving into that. And then of course you do a really deep dive of information. Um, muskie, the, the Native American name is, uh, translates to an ugly pike, which is pretty funny. Obviously they prize pike over muskie, <laughs> which Jen will agree with. <laughs> but um, they're, they're very similar. So pretty much everything that Jen had to offer you uh, about where they hide and how they, they typically hunt is, is exactly similar to pike. Um, there's a few major differences between pike and muskie. Pike are actually a cold water fishery um, where muskie like it a little warmer um, and can tolerate warmer waters. Um, the other uh, particular things, Musky don't have a uh, sticky gelatinous uh, material that goes around their eggs where um, they just fall to the bottom. Uh, so muskie's breeding rate is extremely low uh, where pike does have that sticky substance and their breeding rate is usually a lot better. Um, and when they're cohabitating in these waters, uh, pike are usually fodder fish for muskie. <laughs> It's just the way it, way it shakes down in, in that situation. Um, but it's interesting, especially when both of the species are around. And it's really interesting when pike are the apex predator, they act like muskie, which is really fascinating. I found that out up in Labrador. Um, so one of the things that I like to do when, when introducing people to predator fishing, the odds, and it's gonna be more of a 10 and 12 weight, because the muskies are so big and aggressive and they like to go under the boats or really kind of draw down and they use the full length of their body against your rod. Um, so you need a stiffer rod, meaning the, the heavier weights uh, to handle these bigger fish, um, but do not automatically assume you need a very fast rod. If you are a mid-flex rod person, stick to your casting style. That's the most important thing, or you will wear yourself out prematurely for no really good reason. Um, there's plenty of mid or soft rods in the 10 weight range. I'm a mid flex to a soft rodder. Um, I much prefer those. I have all the power and all the casting ability. You stick a fast rod in my hand and I can't cast worth a, to uh, actually have enough endurance for the day when you're casting. So you don't really need, which way are so you don't really cast a two foot fly all the time. Uh, mostly the 10 and 12 weight is more engineered towards the, the size of the fish that you tend to go after. Um, muskies eat a lot of different things. Um, here up in Maine, up on the St. John's River, um, their primary food source during the summertime is crayfish. There just isn't enough bait fish. So they gorge on crayfish. So it's really important to understand that fishery and what resources are actually available. Um, not only to understand all the resources, but if you can try to prioritize those resources by finding out what kind of food value those resources have. If you figure out that you've got like alewives or um, ciscos or suckers, or like all those are tend to be oilier fish. They have higher food value so that the, the Predators are, are very good at keying in on prime 
higher food value. They'll move more and they'll risk more for that because they know there's more of a kinds of things are really helpful. So you really do have to match the hatch, uh, believe it or not. And when they are going crazy, um, like you know, the previous slide showed these little tiny gizzard chads, I, I kind of got this education um, hard and fast myself uh, one fall. And this is up in, in the UP where there's huge musky waters and there's these two older gentlemen who are in a little like eight foot uh, flatbed bottom boat rowing. Like, I don't know what the heck they think. Maybe they can bait to turn around and catch musky, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> they ended up catching three, three to three musky that night on that little one inch. And I was casting everything I had and didn't have scissors to cut anything down, but quickly realized that that's what they're eating is that little bait that they wanted the bait and they didn't want anything else and they weren't considering anything else. So there are times when you have to really, um, during the off times when there aren't big runs, they're more opportunistic. So yeah, they're going to eat all kinds of things. Uh, but again, they will pay more attention to that hierarchy of food bait. As I said, 10 to 12 weight rods. Um, I typically use sink tips. Those are my primary uh, uh, rod uh, lines that I like to use. Um, I use what's called a clear tip, which is an intermediate clear sink tip. It's a 30 foot. It's kind of stealthy and, and very uh, good way to go at fish that have high pressure. <laughs> Musky actually, and I, I do believe pike do the same thing. So the patterns that I've seen in the waters that I, that I guided on, they would follow their food. Like I was fortunate enough to be friends with some of the DNR folks who were doing studies and they were musky and watching their pattern habits in the spring and then when they moved out of the spring area. So they would follow the, the walleye and other bait fish, you know, like the perch and what have you, whatever was prevalent. They would breed right at the mouths of those rivers where all of those bait fish were running up. Um, right when muskie are born, they eat uh, zooplankton right away, but very quickly once they get into that one inch size, they start eating fish. And they need the, the offspring of the bait that they bred near in order to, to fatten up really quick. So in the springtime, they're following that food to the breeding area. And then the summer grounds, they're moving towards either whatever the dominant food source is, they'll follow that for a while and then just kind of hang out. They're really literally always like around the corner from their food. It could be milling around all the fish and thinking everything's fine and just grab one every now and again and say, yep, there's lunch. <laughs> They're pretty smart and, and they can hang out. And as long as they keep their distance, the other fish don't seem to mind them too, too much. Predator flies, what they really need to do, there's a, there's a, a primary action they need to have. What they need to have, which is called a full profile shot on the pause of your strip. So no matter what line you're using and every big strip that you're pulling, every time you're pausing to grab more line, that fly between the fish and you is gonna give a full profile shot so that the predator has a full profile view of, of this offering. The reason being is pike muskie, they T-bone everything. That's how they, they hit their prey. They don't have tearing teeth. They don't have the ability to rip or tear. That's not what they do. All they simply do is open up their mouths to a, like a bill. They grab and hang on and try to suffocate or hold it until it dies. Then they need uh, molly stuff. So they always tend to eat it head first. Um, so also, um, they also have an anticoagulant around their teeth. So when they do uh, bite down on the, the pr prey, they, they'll try to make them bleed out as well, but that also will happen to you if you get your hands in the business zone. That's another good reason not to put your hands anywhere near it. And you will bleed for quite a while because it takes a while to wear that stuff out. Predator pose. This is something that I like to do to try to help clients really kind of hone in and stay in the game when you're doing eight to 10 hours of this. Of and you only get to see X number of fish within that time frame. You tend to zone out quite a bit which is great, but you gotta be able to keep that A game ready to go because all of a sudden a log appears and you're like, I don't know what to do. Um, so I would constantly make uh, uh, clients either play Pop Goes the Weasel in their head as they're drawing the fly and the closer the fly gets to them, making it. So if they could expect the unexpected, they'll be half prepared. Pike and Muskie, they pounce so fast. They're, they can eat four feet in a flash. They follow the bait four feet behind and then they won't attack until the last minute and they'll eat that distance up in no time whatsoever. They're just, all of a sudden they're there. When the first time when I was actually 
trying to fish for them and trying to understand them. I was fishing along a weed line in a lake, which I have was 10 feet out from the weed line. So I figured I'd have plenty of time to see this come and go. Pike came, bit, spit, ran way before I even had a chance to set a speed this way up. It was a very different speed, very different uh, way of fishing. And you've got to be very ready at all times to set the hook. So that was another thing where I ended up developing when you keep your rod tip in the line, in the water, eight to 10 inches at all times, it maintains a very tight connection between your fly and your uh, fly rod so that there's no slack. And your natural reaction, once you see this Mach 1 fish come and hammer your fly, is you're going to jerk up, which is actually a good thing because that'll have help you to set the hook. But keeping that rod tip in the water is definitely a great way to have a nice, clean, straight, hard set. Because um, slack is very, very evil. So you definitely want to finish your uh, every single cast with a figure eight. And I've heard a wait. I said, okay, yeah, you go ahead. You, you, you're tired. I get it. But um, trust me, it's going to all of a sudden be there. And within one or two of the swings, they see the fish and they're like, oh, I should have kept doing it. It's like, yep. 50% uh, of the hookups can happen at that point. A lot of fish follow deep. You can't even see them. You won't see them until the figure eight. The figure eight is a panic motion of a bait fish when it's caught between the predator and the boat. And, and you could do this on a dock with a lot of ocean fish. You just get right on the dock and you start making giant figure eights. You can call a snook up. You can call all kinds of fish up. This is a common thing that bait does when they panic, which is one of the key things why muskies say, okay, this is great. This is perfect. This is easy. You just keep panicking. I'm just going to figure out when I'm going to get you. So your eights are very important. You want them idealistically to be at least six or eight feet wide. Um, and if you're going to do it parallel to the boat, what you're going to do is be really deep when you're next to the boat. And as you're going away from the boat, you're going to rod tip is going to make the fly more shallow. You want to keep it at least a foot under the water. And then when you come back to the boat for the other eight, you want to go deep on the boat side. That's where it hit. That's going to be able to turn their long bodies around and grab that flies on the eight. There are other methods that you could do. Um, there's the L, which is you can have a fly coming straight in and you do a, a hard left to the, I mean, a hard L to the left or to the right. Uh, that's a great movement too. And that will garner good hits for both pike and muskie. Um, and it's very important not to stop moving your fly because if you do stop moving the fly, the fish will lose interest and go right to the bottom and sulk. And it's very hard to convince them to come back sometimes. So when you're stripping your line in, you're gonna strip it all the way in until they're fly moving my rod. Just as I know I'm getting to this point and I'm in the last strip, I will start the motion so it's seamless and go right into a whole figure eight and then keep it moving, keep it moving, keep it moving. I do at least three to five figure eights before I give up. And I'll even pause between the fourth and fifth just in case they're just down there considering, not sure. And then I'll twitch the fly, make it look motionless, twitch the fly like it's all of a sudden stunned or they want easy meals. These are predators. Apex predators don't want it complicated. They don't want it difficult. They want to eat the weak, sick, and lame. That's their primary job is to clean the genetics of their food resources. A very good purpose for predators, just like sharks as well as an apex predator. It keeps the genetic pool below and clean all the way down to the zooplankton. When you do catch a muskie, you want to make sure you have a very large net. And this holds true with pike as well. I've seen up in uh, some of the lodges in Labrador, they have really tight nets. What happens is, is the fish is bent. It's very uncomfortable when it's in the net. It's going to rake the net, cut the net open, and then it's going to swim away. So the best thing to do is kind of have what I have here is called a playpen. You want it big enough for the fish to rest in. If you give the fish resting time, you have a much better chance of releasing it and unhooking it. Net, the resting time is critical. When you feel your fish is rested enough and it isn't thrashing or anything anymore, then I, what I like to do is I'll wet my hands and I'll go in and touch the side of the fish, just the sides, the middle of the body, all the way down to the tail, maybe touch the tail, get it so used to my hands being around it that it doesn't care that I'm around it anymore. I know I'm not there to eat it. If you grab them too much from the back, these are bird of prey. This is exactly what eagles and everything osprey do. They do not like that. That freaks them out. That will make them thrash and go nuts. So it's really smart to do that. 
if you rest your fish and then you, you get it used to your hands, they are the most gentle giants in your hands. You can really maneuver and do a lot around these fish. I can like to turn them over sometimes, you know, like just like trout, if you turn it upside down, they get nice and calm. Same thing is true of these guys, exact same thing. So I don't tend to use uh, other tools. Um, what I don't use is the bigger pliers. I, these tend to be a little rough on flies. They kind of tear my flies apart. And it's really hard to get the angle. They have a little hook. I don't know if you can see that hook. There's a little hook on the end that you circle around the back of the hook of the fly. You grab it, push, turn, and pull, and it comes right out. No fuss, no muss. You don't have to worry about exactly where is all the fibers because it's usually a mouth filled with hair. Um, I have a 20 inch one that I was using on shark and it worked very well. Um, do not use Boca grippers. These are the worst things ever. So the skin under their mouths just like ours is super thin. I mean, we can pinch right through our jaw from the top and bottom. The same is true of pike and musky, and this just pierces a hole. And if you hold the fish up like this with this, don't do that because it's not good for them, but you will break their jaw by holding them because if they decide to shake, which they will because you're holding them, it's uncomfortable, it's gonna split their jaw, which we don't wanna do that either. So let's not use those. Let's use these kinder grips. These float um, and you can grab and hang on to the mouth. It has a handle where you can put it around your wrist in case they wanna do the gator rolls, which they like to do at times. But if you rest your fish enough, they won't wanna do that. They'll be pretty quiescent. I found if you rest it and the net is big enough and deep enough so that I can push the fish down in the water. And then once I use those kind grips to grab its chin, the mouth stays wide open on the underwater line. If you're having a head above water, stay uncomfortable. If you just push them down under the water line so that their gills are here and their mouths are open, it makes it real easy to get out and they open wide up for you without any force. Uh, uh. But you do got to rest longer. They are meaner. So like I have this gray squirrel and red squirrel syndrome going on with the pike and muskie. The gray squirrel is more like the, the muskie where it, there. So I give them a little extra time to rest because I've been more by them. I've never been by a muskie. Um, hook cutters, much like Jen said too, are super important. They're for you and the fish in case you need to get them out. Um, there's other kinds of hook removers. There are these fancy little doodads. You slide it on the line and then you go all the way down and then you just simply push on the back of the hook and then get it out. Whatever tends to float your boat for comfort, the T-grippers for me are the best. I like them the best because I can grab and hold the back of the hook and never let go of it. This is actually a replica. It's not an actual living fish. It's fascinating. It's wonderfully done. It's awesome. It's also a classic example of how to tell the difference between pike and muskie, whereas the, the scales are only half way up the fish. Uh, the face there, the scales, that's an identifying factor besides the, the sensors underneath the gills, as well as the, the markings on the sides of the fish. So the replicas are awesome. I would highly recommend if you want a wall hanger, all you do is get some great pictures of your fish. You get some overall measurements of length and girth. Um, and then the replicas are pretty amazing. I mean, that past replica, you could even see bloodlines and stuff under there. That They do amazing job and it lasts forever compared to skin mount with a uh, leader setup i typically do what's called a 20 pound break so i'll do the fly line and i'll do a 20 pound stub and then i'll do a loop to loop with an actual four foot of my whatever leader material i want i typically use four carbon at 60 pounds and up i've lost nice fish on 40 don't use 40. um and then i do much like gen 2 i do the wire bite um the real wire i do 30 and so the, the one misnomer is everybody's very worried that these teeth, these toothy fish, they're just so vicious. They're just such horrible nightmarish things. Um, you don't get bit by pike or muskie in the water. I mean, people go swimming in these things all the time. Um, you're not gonna be mauled by them as long as you handle them properly and respectfully. I mean, that's the most important thing. And much like what Jen said too, don't shake the fish, don't rock it. They don't like that. They will bite you for doing that. And in fact, there's plenty of YouTube videos with idiots who've done that and then they get ripped hands because of it. 
best thing to do is is hold it by the tail, try to support it, support it mid body, and let it recoup completely. Um, I typically will hold it in the middle, and then I'll hang on to the tail and I'll jiggle the tail. And if it starts to swim away, then I let it go. Um, but if it won't move from my hands, then obviously it still needs to rest quite a bit more. Um, so this is a nice muskie up in Michigan, up on the guide waters. As you can see the side body there, this is a, a northern strain. This is not a Great Lake strain. The Great Lake strains can get bigger. They can get to about 60 feet. Um, this one typically taps out around 50, 55, um, but they're decent fish and they're nice dark greens. This one's a clear with very little bar markings, which is nice too. It's uh, the same strain we have here in uh, Northern Maine. So that's the quick and dirty. <laughs> That was awesome. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and again, huge thank you to Jen and Lino and Noam. You all are uh, have so much knowledge and so much, uh, you're just incredible anglers. And thank you for just sharing that with everybody. I know that the community is very appreciative and um, thank you. I know it was a lot of work and your time is valuable and we really, really, really appreciate you. So thank you. Lots of fun. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to just uh, stop the share.